to uh, picture that, but to see the maps and to see some of the, uh, you know, see some of it drawn out for you, and then also drawing some of those conclusions uh, really kind of helps you kind of grasp the, grasp the whole ideal um, that we've been talking about the last several months in the book of Acts. And so that does bring us to Acts chapter 20 tonight. We have uh, worked our way uh, all the way up to this point, and we have been following that cycle of Paul going from town to town to town. Common, th- common themes of him being beaten and being uh, uh, persecuted and ran out of the temple and then also going to the Gentiles or to the Greeks. And uh, Paul eventually in chapter 19 and finally said, that's it. It's going to the Gentiles and, uh, you know, my heart is going for those things. Now chapter 20 opens up. He's getting to the end. He wants to go to Jerusalem. We're going to learn a little bit about that tonight and uh, continue talking about that next week and uh, start his third or his last part or journey uh, into Jerusalem uh, for that. But in uh, Acts chapter 20, uh, let's begin with verse 1. It says, After the uproar had ceased, uh, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. And stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him, he was about to sail to Syria. He decided to return through Macedonia, and Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also, Aristarchus and Secutus of the Thessalonians, of Gaius, of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychus, and Trophimus, and Bubba. Those are all them. They all went with him. Of Asia. These men. Going ahead, waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away, verse 6, but we sailed away from the Philippi, from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So, first section here I want to point out a little bit. First is Paul called his disciples or the disciples to himself and did what to them? Embraced them. He embraced them. Paul had a heart for people. He loved people. And you know, when you think about ministry, ministry can be hard. Ministry can be tough. Paul obviously dealt with a lot of heartache and a lot of pain. But the harder the persecution, the softer Paul's heart got. And that's difficult to do. And the only way you can do that is by loving God. If you love God, you will love people. And in ministry or your family or anybody else that you deal with, if you're having a hard time with people, that means you have a hard time loving God. Because when you love God, you're going to love people. And a great indicator with our walk with the Lord is ask this question, do we love people? That's what Paul did. Paul had every excuse to write people off. He had every excuse to not talk to anyone. He had every excuse to go his own way. He had every excuse to retire and never talk to another person. But did he do that? No, he didn't. You know why? Because the more he loved God, the more he loved people. And even at this point in his journey, after all that he has been through, he calls people together and he embraces them. You know, that's a great challenge for us in our church. You know, do we love one another? That's what... That's what Jesus commanded his disciples. They will know uh, me if you love one another. And if we say we love God and we say we're all God's children, then we should all love one another. We should love one another. That doesn't mean we all have to be alike, right? A lot of churches and a lot of people only love the people like them, right? How, how, how hard is that, right? To love people that you like or to love people that are like you. What makes churches so great and the, and the kingdom of God is so great, there's many different kinds of people from many different kinds of backgrounds, all different places in life. There's young people. There's time-challenged people. Uh, that's old people, by the way. Uh, little education, construction workers, school teachers. Look around, and even in the kingdom of God, even in this church, we're not all alike And you're not always going to click with everybody. You're not always going to have the same personality. We have people that talk a lot. A lot, right? (laughs) And we have people that talk a little, right? We have people who are morning people. We have people who are not morning people. We have people who are night owls and people who are not night owls. I mean, you have people that love certain things and do certain things. Personalities, likes, you know, education, wealth, uh, all these different things. There's all these things. We're not always like one another, but we should all love one another. That's the command. The more you love God, the more you'll love people, even the ones that are not like you. 
And so if you're having a hard time loving someone, you got to check and see if you're loving God. Because if you're loving God, then you're going to love one another. And one way you love one another is to pray for one another. If you want a soft heart towards someone, pray for that person. Put them on your prayer list and pray for them every time you pray. Lift one another up. Care for one another. Carry one another's burden. You want to care for someone or love someone? Meet that person in, in a time of need in their life. And you'll see and you'll understand and you'll see the pain in their life. That's what love is all about. And if you don't love one another, like I said, you've got to check your love for God. And for us, we, should, we want to be theologically straight, right? You could be theologically straight as a gun barrel and meaner than a junkyard dog. What good is that, right? It doesn't matter how much you know or how right you are. It also means how much you love people. How much you love them, how much you care for them. And everyone in the Bible that you read that gets closer to God, guess what happens to them? They love people more. Always. Always, always, always. Paul loved God. He loved others. And even in the midst of all this, he had the, every excuse not to care for people, not to love people. But guess what? The older he got, the more he walked with God, and the closer he got to heaven, guess what? He loved, he loved the people. Listen, you better learn how to love them now because you're going to be in heaven with them in eternity, right? Think about that. You've got to love people like God loved them. And Paul shows a great example of this. He, even through the midst of all this and the uproars, calls them together. He's praying with them. He loves them. Then he goes on to minister and look at minister to him. Look at verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart for the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Y'all complained about me being over a couple minutes, right? He, he continued his message till midnight. And there were lamp, many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And, and a window sat, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, and, and who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now, when he had come up, had broken, he had broken bread and eaten, and talk, talked a long while, even until daybreak, he departed, and they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Right? First thing I want you to see now on the first day of the week. It's a major shift in the Bible here. Maybe major shift in the worship of God here. Something that we sometimes don't recognize. It's even a huge change in history in the calendar. Anyone know in the Old Testament when the Jews would worship God? Was it on Sunday? It was on Saturday, right? The Sabbath. That was on the last day of the week. That's when they, the whole world, especially the Jews, understand the Sabbath was for rest and, and worship, just like following after God. But now the followers of God are not meeting on Saturday. When are they meeting? The first day of the week. That's Sunday. That is, that is worship from the last day to the first day. That's also a great representation of God going from being our last fruits to our first fruits. So when we love Jesus Christ, we love him with our first fruits. I think for us as Christians, sometimes we love God and we give him the leftovers, Right? God doesn't deserve the leftovers. He deserves the first fruits. That's why when you, when you give, you give the first fruits. When you, when you serve, you serve the first fruits. When you, when you uh, come with your gifts and your talents, you give them what's, what's the best of you. And so many times in our culture and so many times in the way we are in our Christianity today, we think Sunday is the last day. And, and, and yet Sunday shouldn't be the last day. It's the first day. He should get first of everything we are. First in our devotion. First in, our, first in our preparation in our heart and service to Him. We shouldn't give Him the leftovers, but our first fruits. And you got to ask yourselves, am I giving God the very best of who I am to God? You know, we give it to our career, and we give it to our pleasures, and we give it to our uh, hobbies and possessions. But when it comes to God, well, if I make it, I make it. If I don't, I don't, right? If I pray, I pray. If I read my Bible, I read my Bible. But God says, no, the first fruits on the first day of the week. That's when Christ and his followers would worship him because also that was when Christ was resurrected, right? That's when he solidified his message and he was first fruit on the first day of resurrection. That is the day we worship God and give him the very first fruit. So there they were on the first uh, day of the week. Now, 
Now we're going to get to sleeping in church, all right? So everybody wake up, all right? Everybody wake up. Here we go. Uh, first, I'll, I'm going to show you a video because I found this clip I thought was really, really funny. All right? I, I want to show you this video. A lot of times we're just not listening. You know, we can come to church and just put our minds in a neutral and not hear a word of what has been said. Or we'll fall asleep in church. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, I can see you here. <laughs> this comes as a surprise to some. You see, you see me with your eyes, I see you with my eyes. I see you in the balcony, I see you. And when you fall asleep, I know it. And you know the deal where you do the fake prayer thing? I know it's fake. Because I've done it myself. You know, where you're tired in church, oh, I'm so sleepy, and so you just kind of try to look prayerful. Yes, no. But the dead giveaway is, you know, that's snoring. That's, yes. But don't feel too bad. People fell asleep in the Bible, too, when there was good preaching. In fact, when the Apostle Paul was preaching, a guy named Eutychus fell asleep. He was like on the third balcony, and, and Paul just was going on and on. Eutychus falls asleep and falls to his death, so they interrupt Paul. Paul, a uh, guy was listening to you preach. He just fell off the balcony and died. Paul said, okay, stop the service, went, prayed for Eutychus, raised him from the dead, and then Paul went on and finished his sermon. <laughs> I heard a story about a, a minister that was asked to say a few words, and that's always a challenging thing for a minister to say a few words. We preachers tend to be long-winded, as you know. And uh, this is at sort of a civic function, and the moderator asked the reverend to say something, and the minister got up. I think he had two to three minutes, and the minister went three minutes and was still speaking, and, and then went five minutes, and now it's eight minutes, now it's ten minutes, and so the moderator he wants him to stop. They have a meeting to conduct. He clears his throat a few times, hoping the reverend would notice. The preacher continues to speak, and so the moderator taps his gavel down kind of lightly to get the preacher's attention. Still, this guy drones on. Now it's 15 minutes. Now it's 20 minutes. Now the moderator in frustration is pounding his gavel down to get the preacher to shut up. The minister won't stop finding the moderator at 25 minutes, can't take it any longer, and he throws the gavel at the preacher. He barely misses him and hits an elderly man who had fallen asleep in the front row. The old guy woke up, saw the preacher was still speaking, and said to the moderator, hit me again, I can still hear him. You know, so I don't think that's a true story, actually. <laughs> All right, well, I thought that was funny, right? Have you ever caught yourself sleeping in church, right, and casually you try to hide it like he said? You go into prayer posture, I thought it was really, really funny. But think about this, man fell asleep so bad he fell out a window, right? presumed to be dead and now that didn't stop Paul he got out like he said and and got up just like the verse says he got on he he raised them alive and he went back and kept on preaching all the way through he did nothing deterred him and uh, I know there's a, a little bit of humor to that scripture but I mean what a what a great great uh, picture of Paul and his determination to preach the word to continue to preach the word so let's follow on verse 13 then when he had went to the ship and sailed to uh, uh, sailed to Asus they're, attended, uh, uh, they're attending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he had met us at Asus, we took him on board, came to Mytilene. We sailed from there. The next day we came opposite of Chius. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed in Trigilium. The next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided he had, sail, had to sail past Ephesus and so that he would not have to spend time in Asia. For he was in, he was in a hurry to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So right here begins the burning desire for him to get to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was on his heart. Jerusalem was where he wanted to go. It was um, through these towns that he was going through these towns. But really, his heart was in Jerusalem. He wanted to get to Jerusalem. He wanted to be there, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. And I think Paul, at this point, was getting kind of homesick, not just for Jerusalem, but for heaven. I think he knew his time was coming to a close. He wanted to get to Jerusalem. He wanted to get to uh, the ending point. He wanted to start, his heart started yearning for heaven. 
And you know, doesn't life have a way of preparing you to start yearning for heaven, right? You, you start yearning for that heaven. You start yearning for going home to the Lord. I think Paul kind of figured out he didn't have much time left. He desired to get back to where it all started, to where God had called him so he can get back to that point. And I'll show you how this comes to pass. Look at verse 17. From Miletus, he, he, set, uh, he, he sent to Ephesus, called for the elders of the church. When they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia... In what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I, ba- I, I go bound in the spirit of to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Paul exhorted these believers, not only did I preach to you, but I lived it out uh, with you. That's what he's telling them here. He's saying, listen, at, at the end of verse 23, when he comes in, he says, all these things I know that are waiting for me. Paul in these scriptures is exhorting these believers. He's exhorting these uh, elders of the church. He's saying, I didn't preach it to you. I lived it with you. A lot of times we think preaching is just using words. We do have to preach with words, but we also have to live with our actions, right? We got we to gotta preach it and we got to live it. And Paul was saying, hey, I wasn't just one to preach it and bark out the orders. I lived this out in front of you. He said, I didn't just say it, I I, I lived it. And I think it's important when our sharing of Jesus Christ that we must not only teach it, but we got to live it too. And the message is not just for you, but Paul is saying, it's for me too. Like, I I am in this together, and we're in this together, and there's nothing that I commanded or preached to you that I wasn't willing to live myself. And and, and he's saying, I want want to live this out, and I want you to live this out as, as well. And I think when you see this, what Paul says first is he was the same to all people. He said it didn't matter, Jews or Gentiles. It didn't matter man or woman. It didn't matter what it was. He he was the same to all people. He testified to the Jews. He testified to the Greeks. He testified to them the same message, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love that. You know why? He didn't change his message to fit the culture, right? He didn't change his message to fit the person. And so many times we, when we get ready to share truth, we kind of take a survey of what kind of crowd we're in and we say, well, how, what should I say to this person? And what you say to one person is different than what you say to the, another person. But Paul stuck with the truth. It didn't matter who it was. The message was the same. And I think for us, we can have different methods, but our message should always be the same. If we're gonna if we're gonna share Christ, we need to share Him and Him alone. And, and we may change our methods, whether it's with kids or whether it's with adults or whether it's with uh, uh, any kind of people. But the message is always the same. Paul was the same to all people. Same message. He didn't say you get a pass or you was born this way or I knew your parents. He said no. Here's the here's the gospel. Believing in Jesus Christ and faith in Him and, and, and repentance towards God, that's what, it, that's what it takes. And it was the same message. You know, when we, when we give messages, we ought to give it to the same message to all people. When we don't, that makes us hypocrites, right? As a, as a parent, you want to know what ruins your influence with your children faster than anything else? Is when you say one thing and do another thing, Right? When you treat one person one way and another person another way. And that's what Paul was saying. You know me. I live with you. It didn't matter who you were, where you came from, if you were rich or or you were poor. I preached to you and taught you the same message. And Paul also in in these scriptures goes back to his desire to go back to Jerusalem. He's saying, I know I want to go and I know it's not going to be easy, but that's where my heart is. That's where my call is, that's where my heart is, and I know it's going to be hard, but I'm not deterred by my trials and tribulations. You know, he just keeps on moving forward. He keeps on persevering. I was talking to a pastor yesterday, and we were talking about ministry, and he said, how long have you been a pastor? I said, oh, God, 16 years now. And he's like, 16 years. It's like, wow. He's like, well, how in the world have you you just kept going? I said, I'm just too stupid to quit. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know what to say. 
But trials and tribulations and all these things, you know, as, as a calling comes on your life, it's not temporary. It's not just for a moment. It's, it's for every day of your life. It's for every way. And Paul says he was undeterred by his trials and tribulations. He wasn't a quitter. I love what some older pastors say. Don't be a short timer. Don't be in it just for a few years or a few months. Be in it for your whole life. Like, like that's one thing when we're talking about the graduates this uh, Sunday. I want to challenge them to be in it for the long run. How many people you know start off on their race and they do really, really well, but they get to about that third lap and they fall out, right? They don't finish the race. you got to look at it and say, I'm, I'm in it for the long run. I'm in it for the long haul. God, however, wherever, whenever you take me, I'm, I'm all in. Paul wasn't a quitter. He was in it for the long time, term. He started it and he was going to finish it. And, and, and in verse 24, he says, none of these things move me. None of these things move me, and nor do I count my life dear to me and myself so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. What a testimony, right? He says, none of these things move me, none of these things detour me. He said, nor do I count my life so dear to myself. I think that's one of the biggest issues with us of why we don't follow God, right? As we want our will, we want our way, we want our things. And Paul was saying, I have given up those things. You know a great verse that goes along with this is Galatians 2.20. Paul says in Galatians 2.20 to, to, to the Galatians, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Think about that. I have, cruci I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And in another place, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain in Philippians. And if you were to write that phrase for your life, to me, uh, for me to live is what? Could you put Christ there? Paul could. Paul said he had crucified himself. He had put himself on the cross and he had put Jesus on the throne of his heart and he was living for him and he was going to do it until his last breath. I mean, what a testimony. You think Paul got the message, right? I mean, you think the people that knew Saul before and saw Paul now, you think they really saw something real authentic in his life? Of course they did. They saw someone who was radically changed, and it didn't give, he didn't give up, and he didn't give in. He, he finished the race. He, he crucified himself. And he was, it wasn't his life. He made it all the way, and he says, that I might finish my race. I don't know about you, but I want to finish my race, right? Not just finish it. Look what it says. Finish it with joy. He finished it with joy. You know, they say when you get older, you have a choice. You either get more bitter or you get more joyful in life, right? And you have a choice to make. Even when you serve God, you can become more bitter or you can be, become more joyful. Paul cho chose to be joyful. In his midst of the pain and the heartache and the trials, he wanted to finish his race with joy. And he wanted to finish it with a ministry that he came up with? No, the ministry he received from Jesus Christ. That's why it's important when we talk about a calling. A lot of people say, well, I don't have a calling on my life. If you're a Christian, you have a calling on your life. A calling on your life that God wants to do something in you and through you. That's the call of God in your life. For some of us, as we become parents, that means God has called you to raise your children and nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's, that, that's your calling. Or some of us, it's to, to go into our place, a workplace, and God has given you a calling and a career path, but never lose the mission of going out and sharing Christ with those who are around you and making disciples. The Great Commission, as you are going to make disciples. It is not to make disciples when you get on an airplane and go to on a trip. It's to make disciples where you are. If you are here, you make disciples. If you're there, you make disciples. Wherever you are, you never stop the ministry or the service that God has given you. That's the calling. And I pray that we're like that. I pray that I'm like that. I want to be like Paul and finish the race and finish it with joy. That, that you, don't have to, you don't have to minister you don't have to come to church. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to pray. You get to pray, right? You want to pray. You want to witness. You want to tell people because that gives you joy. And above all that, when you get to the very end, you're going to see Jesus face to face. 
And don't you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Of course you do. Of course I do. And that's what, we, that's what we want to see and that's what we want to hear. And Paul is saying, I have wanted this for my life and I'm going to make it to Jerusalem. I'm not giving up. I'm going to finish my race with joy. I'm going to continue to do what God has called me to do. What a commitment. You know, in our life, how easy do we get knocked off our path? How easy is it that we get pulled away from what, what God wants us to do? Like I said, this Sunday, I'll be talking to the graduates, talking from Hebrews chapter 12. And it says to lay aside every weight, to lay aside the sin that so easily ensnares you, right? Uh, think about that. In our walk with God and our calling with the Lord, there, there's weights that get attached to us as we go through life, right? They're burdens that pull us away and drag us away. The challenge is to lay them aside, meaning that let them have no influence over your life so they don't drag you away from your purpose in life. Same with the sin that he ensnares us, he, he traps us, he tricks us, he, he makes us fall into sin that pulls us away from God's will. Paul's saying, you want to finish the race, you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, that's what I want for my life I could see more in eternity than I can in my real life now. And that good, I mean, that's, that is awesome. Paul, the more he served, the more he wanted to serve. And the further, longer he served, the more he saw heaven and everything he did. And he trusted God. He said, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to make it all the way to the end. Look at verse 25. And indeed, now I know that you all, that's proof that Paul was a southerner, right? You all, right? Now I know that you all... <laughs> Among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not been shunned to declare, to, for I have not, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So Paul is now confessing, he is now proclaiming, he's beginning his goodbye here. Don't you hate sad goodbyes, right? Paul is telling him, you know, I've loved you, you loved me, but you're not going to see my face again on this side of eternity. Paul knew he was marching to, to a point to when God was going to call him home. And he was telling him, now this is the last time you're going to see me, but as, you, as I am leaving, I have this testimony that I'm innocent of all the blood of all men. That means that every person that God had put in my path I was faithful to share Christ with and I'm innocent of the blood of all men I mean what a testimony never missed an opportunity never missed an opportunity to share Christ never missed an opportunity to preach Jesus never missed the opportunity to go to the temple and do what God had called him to do to live no wonder why he's the greatest missionary of all time right I mean he had a he had a passion to share Christ with all people and he says I am innocent or free from the blood of all men and then he says for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He didn't hold nothing back. He gave it to him right as it come out of God's word. And then he challenges them. Look at verse 28. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from amongst yourselves will men rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And, when they, and they, then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him and sorrowing most, of, uh, most for all of the wor words which he spoke that they would see his face no more and they accompanied him to the ship. Wow. I mean, what a departure, right? But what a, what a challenge. He looks to them and he's saying, this is not my church. This is God's church. 
This is God's people. And you need to be overseers and shepherd. Uh, you need to shepherd this church and shepherd the flock because you didn't purchase it. God purchased it with the blood of Jesus Christ. You were an under-shepherd and you were to protect. And part of a shepherd's job was to protect the sheep. Many times at night they would sleep in the gate and they would sleep with a staff and they would sleep with a rod. And any time an enemy would come to them, they would, they would fight them and they would literally put their life on the line to protect their sheep, to keep their sheep from being, ki- sheep from being killed. And he tells them, that's the kind of attitude you've got to have like a shepherd going after these wolves because I'm going to tell you after I leave, there are savage wolves that is going to come among you, not sparing the flock. Does that not come true? You know that for everything that God does, there's always the counterfeit, and there's always those who come, and there's always false prophets, there's always false teachers, there's always wolves amongst the sheep. Amongst the sheep. And he's saying, you have this, you have this protection that you've got to carry this mantle to, to protect them, to, to be the one to stand and be the watchman on the wall, and you need to rise up. You need to be the ones who go against this. People will draw people away and people will do this. And I'm telling you, with, I've, I haven't ceased to tell you this with tears. He pleaded with them. Know it's going to happen. Know it's going to be there. You know, that's part of the job of being a, a shepherd of the church. That's why I looked at our church, the shepherd of our church, me uh, being an under-shepherd of the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. But I looked to all the men of the church as well. God has put us here to protect the flock, right? That's our jobs. Nothing makes my heart happier when you see men coming together to learn God's word, to protect the sheep and protect their families and protect their homes because we know the ravaged wolves are out there, right? We know they're out there to come after our families and our kids and all those things. And he's saying to meet that challenge is you step up and you be the shepherd and you protect and you watch. And just like being a watchman on the wall, don't fall asleep, don't lose the command. There's a very real sense of danger when you do. And man, how that has been true. I could tell you story after story and, and, and time after time of families and churches and denominations where wolves have come in and has, has taken down a certain disciples and pulled them away and did damage that could never, never be repaired, right? And he's saying, but I'm commending you to do this. Look verse 32, he says, Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. And give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He's saying, listen, I have commended you to God and the word of his grace. You have the word of God. That's why we are so big on the word of God and the word of his testimony. That's the power that we have. That's, the, that's what he says he's commended them to. And I love his, just his personal testimony here. I have coveted no one's silver and gold apparel. Paul's saying, I didn't do it for the money, and I didn't take anyone's silver, and I didn't take anyone's gold. I didn't do it for the fancy clothes. Man, he wouldn't make a good TV preacher today, would he? Right? He wouldn't make it good as being called Creflo Dollar today, would he? But he, <laughs> he, he was like, listen, I, I didn't take none. I didn't covet none of those things. I didn't want none of those things. You saw how I provided for myself, and I did that to labor. And why did I do all these things? Because just as I had remembered, or just like he said, Jesus has said, and he says this at the end of verse 35, it is more blessed to give than receive. And that's the testimony that Paul had. That's the life that he lived. He would rather give than receive. You know, I think we could take that in our modern day culture today and go a long way with that, right? Now, we're taught as soon as you come out of the womb to have your hand out, right? For someone to give something to you. Even think about the way people approach church or approach uh, Christianity. They come to it and they say, what can you do for me? What kind of program do you have for me? What kind of, what kind of place do you have for me? What, kind of, what can you do for me? Where Christianity is not what you can do for me, it's what can I do for you? What can I do for God? What can I do for others? Because you know what God has given you, it is more blessed to give than receive. And I have certainly found that true to be in my life, uh, true to be in my life as well. Listen, you're never more like God when you give, when you sacrifice. I think about Jesus Christ being the greatest leader of all times, and he was a, he was a servant leader. He didn't lord over or dominate his disciples or his apostles. He was a, he was a servant. He washed their feet. He, he gently pulled them along and he led them and he loved on them and he showed them the way. He was a servant leader and he gave. And he, and he said, you're never more like Jesus when you give. 
And for you and for me, that's what we must realize, that it's not about what we can take, it's about what we can give. You want longevity in ministry, you want longevity with your kids, you want longevity with people to be in your life, then you ought to give more than you receive from them. When people walk away from you, what do they say? Man, they just took something out of me, right? Or do they say, wow, that person just blessed me and, and give me something. Not just money, but encouragement. Just a word of God, just prayer, just an encouragement to come. And, and even through the rest of it, saying this is the way it is. This is real Christianity. This is, this is boots on the ground kind of Christianity. And he says when he said all these things, he knelt down, he prayed with them all, and they all wept freely, and they kissed him, and they loved Paul. When you see this, not only did Paul love them, but they loved Paul. Paul had hard things to say to him. Paul had the word of God to teach them. Paul had this thing, but you know what? They loved him and they respected him because he, when he spoke to them, they knew he was speaking the truth and they knew what he said was true and they all was upset because they said they would see his face no more and they saw his way. They walked him to the ship for him to, be leave, to leave and they knew they'd never see Paul this side of heaven again. I mean, what a chapter, right? I and mean, what a story. I mean, you read the book of Acts, you read the Bible, I don't know where people say the Bible's boring, right? And the Bible's not boring. And I think when you read these stories and you see them come alive and you try to apply them to our life today, I mean, what a, what a great way for us to think about our lives. I think about a couple challenges, like we say here, you know, do we love people? You know, do we love people? If we're not loving people, you've got to check your love for God. If you're loving God, you're going to love people. I've always said that. And the Bible says that. Paul says that here. Second thing you got to look at is, uh, are you ministering to others on the first day of the week? Or are you giving God your first fruits? Are you giving God your first fruits or are you giving him your leftovers, right? Does he get the end of your week or does he get the first part of your week? And, and even just not on Sunday, but that sets the tone for the rest of every single day after that. To say, hey, I'm putting this aside so that I can give God my first fruits, the best that I have. The best that I have that God has given me, I'm going to give it back to him. And then, as we just said as well, for Paul knowing that he's getting to heaven, to know that he's going to finish strong, that no matter what happens, it's not going to knock him off our, uh, his path. It's not going to drag him away. And as he does that, he challenges them. He wants to finish his race with joy. And I hope for us that we want to finish that race with joy and ask God to help us keep walking and taking one step in front of the other to keep going, to have joy in Jesus and serving the Lord together and then as we get for our time to go as we look we knew and we could say like Paul it was more blessed to give than to receive I mean what a testimony and I pray tonight as that challenges us in our hearts that we will seek our hearts and ask God about these things in our life to see if we're more like Christ through those things let's pray together then we'll take questions and answers and talk about the chapter here all right let's pray Dear Father, we do come before you, God, and we just thank you for your word. And God, I do pray as we look at this story, God, and I pray as we continue to consider this, Lord. I pray that our hearts will be moved tonight, Lord, and challenged tonight, Lord. Now, what a testimony Paul was, Lord. And as we look to Paul, we see Christ. And just as the video said that Paul looked to himself and the sufferings of his life, not even worthy to be compared to the sufferings of Christ, but he knew as he sacrificed and as he loved and he has shared Christ over and over that he too longed for heaven. And he wanted to finish his race and finish his course. And he wanted to go home to see God. And God, what a great promise we have for heaven. That we know this earth is not all there is to it. And through sufferings and through trials, by faith we know there's coming a time when we'll be home. When there'll be no trials and there'll be no troubles. And there'll be, we'll be in the presence of God for eternity, God. And I pray that we will live with that in mind, Lord, that we won't give in to this world. We won't turn away, that we will be watchmen on the wall. We will guide, we will protect, we will give and not receive. And we will be the same to all people and point them to Jesus Christ, whether it's in our home, our neighborhood, at the school or wherever we go. We'll continually point people to Jesus Christ until you call us home, Lord. And I pray as our, it'll be our desire to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant one day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.